webinar today is sponsored by University of Georgia Extension Service and the Master Gardeners of Cherokee County. We will be discussing vegetable gardening in three parts. The first is getting ready. Um, you, have to, you have to do a few things to get your garden started off right. It will save you immensely in the long run. Then we will be discussing actually planting your garden, what you'll choose to plant in your garden, and then how to care for your garden. So getting ready, the most important thing you have to do is to choose a location. Now, assuming you're doing this in some property that you live on, you only have so many places to choose from. So you have to be a little, um, a little tolerant of imperfection. If you don't find the absolute perfect place to put a garden, you'll find a perfect place for your garden. And then we will discuss the soil and what you need to do to prepare your soil and the equipment. Where will your garden be? First, all gardens, uh, not all gardens, all vegetable gardens, pardon me, need a sunny location, six to nine hours of sun every day. So walk around your yard, take a look from the morning till later in the afternoon, and find a spot that's going to give you six to nine hours of sun. Soil is really important for your garden. You want to avoid a hard, compacted, graveled area. You can fix all of those things, but it's going to make it much more difficult. So if you had a place where you used to have a swimming pool or you used to have a driveway, don't make that your first choice if you can avoid it. The next thing is that you need drainage. It's really important to have sufficient drainage, good drainage. Plants do not like the roots to uh, sit in water. They don't like wet feet. You also need to provide water for your garden. It will need water all throughout the summer unless we have a magical summer and just the right amount of rainfalls all the time. Um, I had a garden once that was way out in a field way far away from my house and I had to haul five gallon pails of water all summer and believe me that got old really fast. So if you have a water source close to your house, it's going to make it a lot easier for you. And the general distance to your house, if it's, you know, if you can pop out to your garden in two minutes, it's going to be a lot easier than if you have to go a long way. Another thing to consider is whether your children will participate. Um, my kids are always in my garden for better or worse. And, uh, I didn't want them too far away from the house. I wanted to be able to know where they were, where they had gone to. So think about that if your children are going to be helping. Another thing to consider is the critters. Uh, we have a lot of deer in this area and I don't know how to have a garden without a fence. I guess some people are able to do it, but just think about that. If, it's, if your garden is way out on the edge of a field or the woods someplace, you're probably going to have more uh, animals that would like to participate and share in your garden. And then how big will your garden be? Start small, make it easy on yourself. If you haven't ever had a vegetable garden, don't go plow the back 40. It's going to be really hard to keep up with, with a garden that big to begin with. So start small, learn the things that you need to learn and then you can enlarge your garden as you'd like to. The next thing is the soil, texture, and fertility. Obviously, your plants are growing in the soil. They have to have really good soil to grow. Um, the best thing you can do for yourself is to have a soils test done. I didn't do this for a number of years, and uh, once I finally did, I realized that I wasted an awful lot of time trying to do things that I didn't have any information to fix. Go to the extension service. Um, you will find little brown paper bags there. It's a soil sample bag. It costs about $9 to have the test done. And you can actually bring your soil with you and do this right outside there so you can return your bag immediately. But you'll take eight to, six to 10 scoops of soil from around your garden and dig down six to 10 inches and take your sample from the very bottom of the hole that you've dug. Put them all in a bucket all together, mix them all well, and then you'll fill the soil bag up. Um, another suggestion is that you write all your information on the bag first and then put the dirt in. 
the soil, you're not supposed to call it dirt, <laughs> put the soil in the bag after you've written all your information on it, it makes it a lot easier. When you get your report back, it's going to suggest two really important things to you. The fertilizer requirements um, for whatever type of garden you have indicated you are growing, that, that it will tell you what you need, how much of the fertilizer you need, um, and it's going to tell you what pH adjustments you need. pH is a measure of the acidity in the soil, and it makes a difference on how the plants are able to utilize the fertilizer, uh, the nutrients in the soil. We have three primary nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. There are many secondary and tertiary nutrients, but those are the primary ones that you will be most concerned about having the proper balance of. Georgia actually has um, very nutritious soil, but pH limits the availability of the nutrients to the plants. Native Georgia soil is about a pH of four and a half to five and a half, makes it a little bit acidic. pH goes on a range from one to 10, and seven is neutral. So you want your soil to be a little bit acidic, but not quite as much as the uh, native Georgia soil. Your soil test report will advise on adding nutrients and pH modifiers. Most vegetables grow best in a pH of six to seven, except Irish potatoes, which prefer a pH a little bit under six. Changing your soil pH. Um, I don't know anyone who hasn't had to change their pH um, here unless they were growing potatoes, but most of our soil is the slightly acidic. You will use lime to raise the pH. If you needed to lower your pH, you would use sulfur. Ground lime or sulfur is best applied in the fall, it allows it time to break down, but you can use finely ground lime to change the pH a little more quickly. So if you didn't get a soil test in the fall, you can still put uh, lime down on your soil and help it, help it adjust the pH a little bit. Um, please use the information from your soils test. Um, don't just go adding lime to your soil. Don't go adding nitrogen. Don't just go adding any of those major nutrients or the pH modifiers. Use your soils test report. It will save you a lot of work and money in the long run. Soil texture is another really important thing to consider. You can see a hand there holding um, a handful of soil and they've compressed it into a ball. Soil, uh, soil needs to hold some air and it needs to hold some moisture. Um, when you have that clump of soil in your hand and you squeeze it, you want, to, you want it to come together, but, but if you were to drop it on the ground, you want it to break apart. If it doesn't do that, it's probably going to be a little too dense for your uh, plants to succeed in it. You might have to add um, something to help the texture, such as compost. Compost is the best thing to add to your soil. It's just broken down organic material leaves and garden clippings and so forth, um, that they help to change the texture of their soil. And it also helps uh, the, to hold water and uh, have more air in the soil. Um, you want to avoid compacting your soil. So when you're doing your garden, you don't want to be running over it uh, any more than is absolutely necessary to create your beds and your walkways. You can add a cover crop in the fall, something like clover, which you would then dig in in the spring and that helps to add some um, organic material to your soil also. Equipment is really simple and you don't need anything expensive to have a vegetable garden. I use gloves. I do use masks when I spray anything. Um, you need some hand tools, a trowel, shovel, a rake, Row markers, something that is really helpful for row markers is plastic spoons. And if you write on them with a pencil, it actually lasts through the whole season. You can still read whatever your, whatever your vegetable was, even at the end of the season. Um, I use small sprayers. I don't have a garden that requires great big gigantic sprayers, so I use small sprayers. Um, make sure you only use your sprayers 
for one kind of thing. Do not mix pesticides with fertilizers. Do not mix herbicides with fertilizers. You'll make a big mistake. There's always a residue in the bottle and so you don't want to mix those up. And most importantly is label the bottle. Do not use any food containers for um, putting anything in. Even, even something like a fertilizer can be really harmful to somebody if a child got a hold of it. If they see a bottle of Coke, looks like a bottle of Coke, they take the top off and they drink some fertilizer, it's not going to be a good day for you. I actually know someone who was given um, something that they thought was to help an upset stomach and it turned out to be a homemade a recipe for um, furniture stripper, and that was an emergency room accident. Um, so label your bottles and just be very careful, keep them up out of the reach of children. So now you've found the perfect space for your garden. You have the right amount of sun, it's close to the house, you can manage where it is. Um, you've, you've tilled it up, you've added your fertilizer or lime, sulfur, depending on uh, what your soils test has advised you to do. And now you're ready to plant. So garden preparation is the next thing to talk about. If it's a new area and you're going to till it, don't till when it's wet, not right after it rains, you'll make a terrible mess of the soil. And don't do it when it's too dry. If it's windy and dry, your soil is just gonna blow away while you're tilling. So you squeeze a handful of soil, you press a finger into the lump. If it breaks apart, it's probably okay to till it at that time. Now, before you start tilling, you might want to make a sketch of your garden, decide where things are gonna grow. Um, if it should be up against your house, you wanna make sure you put uh, tall things in the back of the garden and the lower things toward the front of the garden so everything can get some sun. Um, make wide beds rather than a whole bunch of skinny rows. Put your beds back to back so you can eliminate one, one um, aisle for walking in as long as you can still reach across the halfway across that bed. It, decide if you're going to have hills perhaps for pumpkins and squash, if you're going to make raised beds for all of your vegetables, if you're going to grow things on fences or on poles. So just plan your garden out. You can also use pots and bags for patio gardens. Leave room for paths. I am redoing uh, some of my garden right now because I thought I didn't need to get my cart down to the back of the garden and I made little tiny narrow pathways and I regretted it. And so they're being redone now to allow my cart to come down to the end. And another very important thing, which will help you from year to year tremendously, keep your, keep your sketch of your garden where you have planted everything and rotate your crops from year to year. It, on the UGA website, you'll find something to help you um, group your plants into four categories and then it shows how you can rotate those every year. It helps prevent the spread of soil borne diseases from one year to the next. How much to plant? Be reasonable. <laughs> what will your family actually eat? You might be able to grow the most fantastic kohlrabi, but has your family ever eaten kohlrabi? I have planted soybeans and my family looked at me like, what am I gonna do with this? They didn't wanna have anything to do with soybeans. Um, it's, it was an adventure, but it, it wasn't worth the time and effort. So think about what your family will really eat? What will they enjoy? I mean, little kids always enjoy, you know, cucumbers and radishes and tomatoes, um, things that they can go out and pick and then put in a salad and have on the dinner table quickly. Um, do you want uh, vegetables just for the season? Are you just going to grow the things that you're going to eat as they are produced in the garden? Or do you want to can or freeze things? So think about how much space you want to um, accord to each kind of vegetable and how much you're you going to eat. The other thing to consider is you may have a whole bunch of lettuce, um, but do you need 10 lettuces on one day? Because if you plant them all on the same day, you're going to get 10 lettuces already at the same time, and you're going to be uh, bringing them to your neighbors. You'll be known as the lettuce lady. When to plant or sow. Um, before the last frost date, which is about April 20th, you can plant cool weather vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, kale. Um, you can buy plants for that right now. You can also sow those things. 
uh, when the weather is a little bit cooler, but don't plant if the ground is soggy. Don't plant anything in cold, damp uh, soil. They, they just don't like it. The seeds will rot. Um, after the last frost, plant your warm weather vegetables, tomatoes, eggplants, pepper. They need a soil temperature of at least 70 degrees. Um, generally, all seeds are okay after the other, other seeds are okay after the soil reaches 65 degrees. Succession planting. Um, like I said about lettuce, you don't need um, 10 heads of lettuce, you don't need quarts of radishes all at the same time. So pick a little bit of these, put a few in, and then every week or every two weeks, you can do succession planting, plant another little bit of a row. So save a little bit for your second planting of those kinds of things. Um, things like summer squash, um, I plant twice a year. So I put them in early and then I, I start them again um, later, a little bit later in the summer to have a second crop of the summer squashes. How do you plant things? For seeds, I mean, the, the package direction will usually tell you how to plant them, how far apart to put your seeds and how deep they need to be. Uh, usually I just use my fingers or a trowel to create furrows. You put your seeds in according to the spacing they recommend, tamp it down, and when you're done planting everything, water it. Uh, for a plant, if you've raised plants or you're purchasing plants, you're going to plant at the level of the top of the root ball. Don't plant it deeper and don't leave any roots above the ground. So right at the level of the root ball. Loosen the root ball gently. And then when you put it in, press the soil up around the root ball, pat it down a little bit. You're not trying to um, stomp on it. Don't do that. But press it down and again, water it, uh, water it more deeply than you did your seeds. The only exception to this is tomatoes. Tomatoes actually do better if you take a couple of sets of leaves off the bottom, this is from the soil up, and plant the tomato deep all the way up to the next set of leaves. Uh, they'll grow roots all along that stem and it will help your tomato get a really good start. For spacing, follow the directions on the packages again. Um, all plants need, they need sun, water, nutrients, and ventilation. If you crowd them together, they're going to be competing with each other. And you, you may get a whole bunch of small things, but you won't get the good size ones that you would really like to get. Um, in, in addition, you're going to need to um, thin some of these things. So it's very hard to plant a lettuce seed uh, six inches apart, they're so tiny, it's practically impossible to do that. So we, um, we suggest that you plan on thinning. It might be hard to do, but you, you really need to do it. When you're putting out plants, you want to wait till the end of the day or do it on a cloudy day or before you know it's going to rain because the, the plants will be in shock from being uh, handled and their roots being handled and so forth. So do it on a time that gives the plant a little bit of a break. You, you don't wanna do it when it's a hot, windy day. To preserve moisture, to prevent weeds, um, to keep the soil at an even temperature, to help prevent disease, because there are diseases in the soil that will splatter up with rain, um, and for erosion control, you want to put mulch around your plants. Mulch can be um, leaves, it can be pine straw, it can be bark chips, it can be newspaper. Um, you can also use synthetic um, <clears throat> mulches like plastic or rubber. But remember, the organic things can be tilled back into the soil. Um, rubber and plastic, do not try to, to till um, your plastic back into the soil. Do not plan on putting rubber uh, mulch back into the soil either. So mulch is really, really important. This will be um, a big determinant of your success because it, it does, it keeps the moisture in the ground. It prevents weeds from sprouting. It keeps the temperature at an even uh, place and it will help prevent disease. Don't let your seeds dry out. 
Seeds are tiny little things. They don't need to be watered so deeply. They need to be watered sufficiently so that they don't dry out. As they sprout and grow, you'll need to water them less frequently and more deeply. Generally at about 70 degrees, your garden will need one inch of water a week. In very hot weather, it can need up to two and a half inches a week, about a half an inch more for every 10 degrees. And so in Georgia, you can plan on needing a little bit more than an inch of water a week here as the summer goes on. So again, what will your family eat? I grew my vegetables, and this is not a botanically correct grouping. I group them into three things, fruits, um, zucchinis, tomatoes, um, things that need a pollinator or wind um, to actually produce a fruit. Then you have roots, things like radishes, potatoes, the, where the part that you eat grows in the ground. That does not need pollinators. And greens, um, lettuce and bok choy and kale and anything that you're eating, the foliage portion of the plant, those don't need pollinators either. That can make a difference into how you decide to grow those vegetables. I also always plant flowers. Flowers will attract pollinators and some will actually repel some insects. They also just look beautiful. And so they're really nice to have out in your vegetable garden. Um, when you're choosing what vegetables to grow, there are many, many things that are disease resistant. Nothing is disease proof, but they're disease resistant. Particularly if you look at tomatoes, tomatoes seem to have a never ending list of things they're susceptible to and their bacteria infections and viral infections. Viral infections cannot be treated. There's, there's nothing that can cure a viral disease. So if you are looking for tomatoes and you can look and see what, what it says they're resistant to, that is that will really make a big difference and help you a lot in not having problems with growing your tomatoes. Um, start in advance. Uh, you can grow things yourself if you like to do that. You can start lots of different things, particularly tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, um, broccoli, cauliflower, cucumbers, squash, um, lettuce, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, you're, they're going to start a little bit differently. They don't start from seeds. Um, but you can start them in advance yourself or buy plants. Um, the uh, sweet potatoes, you can actually start a sweet potato from a sweet potato. You just stick them in some water and it's grow these little shoots, but you can also buy the, the little plants in the, in the market. Um, cucumbers, squash, and lettuce can also be direct sowed. And that means you're just putting those seeds directly into the soil in the garden. Peas, beans, corn, okra, radish, beets, other root crops, those are things that you do not want to buy the plants. You'll have much better success if you direct sow them from seeds into the garden. Now, as far as caring for your garden, um, your plants need food that, that comes some from the air, um, some from the soil. So you need nitrogen that promotes the green growth of your plant. Phosphorus promotes roots and flowers. Potassium kind of balances the top growth and the root growth. Use a slow release fertilizer when planting according to the package directions. Every two weeks, use a liquid fertilizer or buy the powdered kind of fertilizer, but you're going to add water to it and you can spray it on or you can use it as a soil drench. Nitrogen only lasts two to three weeks in the soil. So your plants will have used up most of the nitrogen in the soil by then. So you do need to reapply it as your plants are growing. So you're going to want to replenish mulch throughout the season. Uh, again, straw, fabric, chopped leaves, Weed. It's really important get those weeds when they're early because they are using up all of the um, all of the nutrients that your plants need to grow. Um, it reduces the competition with your vegetables and thin again thin. Um, harvest frequently. Don't let your zucchini grow to be baseball bats. They will not be good. They will not. Uh, they will not taste nearly as good as they when they're little, and they kind of suck all the energy out of the plant. So you want to pick them small, and that it will encourage more production. 
You need good sanitation in your garden. That helps helps the weeds. Uh, if you remove weeds early before they bloom, then the seeds don't spread for those weeds all over your garden. And definitely remove disease plants, even if it's the thing you're trying to grow. If you're not having success controlling a disease, take it out. Don't put it in your compost pile, throw it away. You really don't want diseased plants hanging around any place in the garden. You can also, um, Clean tools, um, you can use, uh, bleach is hard on tools, so don't use bleach on your tools. You can use bleach on wooden things such as garden stakes and so forth if you feel you need to clean those really well. Otherwise, use Lysol or alcohol uh, to clean your tools in the garden. Water is very important and you can overwater your garden and you will get rotting tomatoes and lots of other problems. It encourages fungus. It's not a good thing to overwater and it's just a waste of the water. When you don't know if your garden needs more water, stick your finger in the soil. Look down about two inches deep. If it's dry, then your plants probably do need some water. If it's still moist, not wet, just moist, wait a little bit. It needs, again, up to one week, an inch a week, um, up to two and a half inches in really hot weather. A drip irrigation, if you can install one, makes gardening so much easier. It's a, a system of hoses that are spread out among your plants and they have little tiny holes in them so that when you turn this on, the water literally drips, drip, drip, drip. And it waters the soil, not the plants. So it gets right where you need it, which is to the roots. It doesn't spray water up so the, the leaves don't get wet. It's much more efficient, it uses less water and you can put them on timers, which is all a really nice thing to do. If you have to use um, overhead watering with a hose, water early in the morning, uh, do not water the leaves. Bend down and get the water down to the soil. Um, don't water in the evening. Wet plants are much more susceptible to fungus. And, and uh, it, it's a, a lot neater. The um, drip irrigation uh, does not cause erosion, whereas a hose, uh, you can make big holes all around your plants spraying too much water. Pollinators and beneficials. Pollinators are uh, insects um, that um, are bees, flies, butterflies, and other things that help to spread pollen around in your garden and that will fertilize the, the uh, plants that you are growing. They're necessary for many plants to produce the part of the plant that you want to eat, such as a cucumber, melon, squash, pumpkins, okra. Those need pollinators. There are also other uh, insects in your garden. Not every insect out there is a pest. There are many that are uh, beneficials. They eat other insects. So ladybugs, praying mantis, lacewing, those are things that are helpful for your garden. Um, if you are thinking you have a garden problem with a pest, look at it carefully first and decide if it's really worth doing anything about. Some pests are there and they don't really cause a lot of damage. Um, you might see aphids. You can spray aphids uh, with the hose and just knock them down. Um, you don't have to get poisons out the first time you see a bug crawling around your garden. Um, to protect and support pollinators and beneficials, use any kind of um, sprays with caution. Use them late in the day when the pollinators and beneficials are no longer actively out in your garden. You don't want to be spraying the bees um, with, with this because the, the bees are very, very sensitive, very susceptible to toxins. Um, plant flowers in the garden, again, to, especially colorful ones, will attract more pollinators and beneficials. Put a little bird bath out or even a shallow dish, just a clay, a clay dish you can put out in the garden with water in it. And that encourages um, the pollinators and beneficials to come around your garden. Plants that don't need pollination, um, the roots and the greens can be grown under row covers. And those can be plastic row covers. Um, you can completely cover them up. And there are nets also that can be used. You can keep all the pests out, mostly. Um, but uh, that's a lot more work to do. One more thing to have to do to create your rows and so forth. Choose resistant varieties, disease resistant varieties to lessen the possibility of diseases. Keep your plant leaves dry when you're watering. 
and give plants enough space for ventilation. I know it's tempting when you've got a six pack of tomatoes and you really only have space for five and you just want to squish that other tomato in there. Well, remember they're all competing for the same water and sun and nutrients. So give it to your neighbor. Um, if you feel you really have a, a bug problem that you have to do something about, about, when you look at the, most of these things are sprays. Um, they are selective or non-selective. Uh, a selective product means that it only treats certain bugs. It's not a broad spectrum. So be very careful. If you can, if you know what the bug is you're having a problem with, choose a selective product and use it very carefully. Even organic sprays are toxic. They, they wouldn't work if they weren't toxic. Some things are contact poisons and you have to use them when you actually see the bug. Insecticidal soap and pyrethrin are things that there's no point spraying them around if you don't see the bug out. You actually need it to get onto the bug. Um, horticultural and dormant oil sprays, which are more commonly used earlier in the season, actually smother bugs. Um, so you will be spraying that on the plant and it uh, will smother the, the um, pests. Uh, Bt is another uh, kind of poison. It's actually a bacteria. It's an ingestion poison, and it means that has to go onto the plant uh, foliage because the bug needs to eat that. That's how they that's how they get it. They eat the poison. They eat the leaves that have the Bt on it, and it paralyzes their um, digestive system, and they die. But be very careful with any kind of sprays. Uh, they do, they do affect more than just the bug you're trying to get rid of. So use caution. If you don't know what kind of bug you have, you can ask the extension service. People there are ready to help you. Um, these are the, the things that I use um, fairly successfully, uh, neem oil. Neem oil is effective against fungicides and some insects. Spinosad um, is a contact poison and also an ingestion poison. So if it's on your plants and they eat it, it will help to kill bugs. But again, it might help kill something you're trying to encourage to grow there. And then there are barrier, um, barrier sprays such as kale and clay. And kale and clay is a powder that you mix in water um, you spray it on the plant and the plants don't like to chew through it. They don't, they don't care for the texture of it. So it can help uh, repel insects from actually uh, bothering your plants to begin with. And then there are traps. Uh, certain colors attract um, some things um, and some of them have pheromones in them. Use pheromones with great caution. Um, sometimes a pheromone can attract all the bugs to your garden. So if you wanna use a trap, you might wanna put it away from your garden, try to get the things to go away, uh, particularly things like Japanese beetles. Um, Japanese beetle traps should not be in your garden. There are a couple of common things that you will probably encounter. Um, calcium deficiency is one of the things that you might find. It causes a brown spot on the bottom of your tomatoes. It, 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 it's rotted. It doesn't look good. Uh, tomatoes, squash, it can be on peppers, um, eggplants. Um, it's caused by uneven watering, by getting too much uh, water or too little water. So the easiest way to prevent blossom end rot is to um, have even watering throughout the season. You can also use calcium antacid tablets dissolved in water. Um, you crush them up, uh, swirl them around in water and use it as, you can spray it on the foliage, but they don't really absorb much calcium that way. But if you use it as a drench, it will be absorbed a little bit better and that will help to prevent it also. Tomato hornworms are really beautiful. They're astonishing big worms. They can be five inches long. They're bright green with white stripes on them and a little red horn on top of their head. Um, they're really gorgeous. They are the larva of a moth. Um, and because they're so big, or they will grow to be so big, 
you can probably just pick them off. You'll, you'll look at your tomato plants one day and you'll see that only the ribs are left and the soft uh, leaves have been eaten away. Sometimes they eat some of the tomatoes too, um, but they're really quite beautiful. And uh, you can pick them off and I just throw them in the woods and hope that some bird eats them. I don't squish them. They're just um, too beautiful to squish. So just try to pick your tomato hornworms off and, and uh, you can probably pay your kids a nickel a worm and, and they'll probably enjoy taking them off too. Another thing that is very common are squash bugs. Squash bug adults are shield shapes. They're probably a half to three quarters of an inch long. Um, you'll see them on, on your plants and the, the adults are not the ones doing the damage so much, it's the young ones. Um, the young ones are gray and you will all of a sudden see a whole bunch of these little light gray bugs crawling all around. If you flip the leaves up of your plants, you'll see little egg clusters. They're kind of shiny bronze egg clusters. You can remove the egg clusters, scrape them off. Um, you can knock the, the, little, uh, the little squash bugs into a bucket of water. Uh, they move real fast. Um, to help prevent this, you can spray the plant with the kale and clay spray because the squash bugs don't like it too much. And you can spray the adults with neem oil to try to stop the breeding cycle so you won't get uh, many seasons of them, which will happen if you don't do anything. And this is one of my favorite, most hated bugs in the garden is a squash borer. Attempt to prevent squash borers from even getting into your plant because they're, they're hard to deal with. They're going to bore into the bottom of your squash plant um, and they'll leave a little bit of sawdust. It'll be a little brown sawdust residue and that's where they've chewed up and, and uh, extruded this little sawdust material. You can try to cut the stem open above the, where the sawdust is and remove the borer. As you can see, the, it's right inside there, a little white worm in there. Squish, <laughs> really just squish them. Don't even put those out in the woods, squish them. Um, you can try yellow sticky traps that may catch the adult moths before they, they start um, laying eggs. You can try to wrap the stem of your squash when it's small uh, with foil. Start about a quarter of an inch, a half an inch below the surface and then wrap it two to three inches above. You're gonna have to redo that a couple of times as your plant continues to grow. Uh, you can spray the plants early with kale and clay. And again, the squash borers don't seem to like to chew through it. Um, you can grow a catch crop of something like Hubbard squash, which they really like. Again, I'm not sure if you're really just encouraging Hubbard squash, um, more squash borers by having Hubbard squash for them to live in. I'd plant it away from my garden and um, make, make sure that you are really uh, active in, in treating it. Um, or there are some borers, um, I'm, pardon me, there are some squashes that borers do not prefer. Um, a butternut squash, crookneck yellow summer squash, and tromboncino, also called a rampicante, it's an Italian uh, style squash. It has a solid stem, so the borers cannot actually bore into it. Uh, and that is a squash that you can pick small like a zucchini, or you can let it mature like a winter squash. And you can have, I had one that was about three feet long and we just finished eating it uh, recently. It's a really great addition to a garden because you can get kind of two vegetables out of one. So if you take a little time to get your soil tested, if you uh, follow the directions that they give you, find a good place for your garden, pick the right plants, um, do choose disease resistant varieties, and take a little bit of care in your garden, I think you'll have a successful time growing vegetables. And again, start small, grow bigger with your experience. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, we have a reference page here with lots of information for you about gardening. Um, and again, thank you very much. All right, well, uh, Kathleen did an excellent job of covering most everything there. Um, if you guys have questions now, um, go ahead and keep throwing them into the chat and uh, either I can address them uh, here through the microphone or we can um, attempt to turn it over to you to ask questions. Um, 
So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're still on for the next few minutes. If we have more questions, uh, if there's more detail in what um, Kathleen had covered, if you would like us to further explain some of those things that you may have questions on, um, now's the time. Uh, we still have, you know, probably another good month uh, before a lot of our um, prime vegetables, uh, you know, the summer favorites like squash and uh, tomatoes, peppers and things like that really should be planted because, you know, gosh, if it's anything like last year, we may have a, a frost event uh, well into April. And last year, gosh, it was May 11th and we got pretty darn close to uh, a freezing event. Uh, further north of us, they did have a frost on that May, um, May 11th. I think we hit somewhere like 35 degrees and I was out there burying my tomato plants and peppers in pine straw for two nights in a row. So um, we've got a long <laughs> growing season. So while it is fun to have that tomato sandwich in June, um, you know, you may be in a situation where you're having to replant if you go ahead and get too ambitious and plant early. So um, can we get a copy of the presentation? Absolutely. So I've recorded this and uh, like I said, we'll get it loaded onto the uh, uh, YouTube channel. I'll send you all a link to that recording and a link to an evaluation if you wouldn't mind uh, giving us some feedback. One thing to be cautious of uh, here in Cherokee County, one thing I, I run into with uh, gardeners calling a lot uh, every year is using uh, manure sources um, from the, the numerous uh, horse owners uh, or stables in the area. Um, there can be some herbicide carryover in those um, fields, the hay sources or the pastures where those horses are grazing. Uh, and that uh, herbicide can stay active through that digestive process. And if that uh, manure has not been properly composted uh, for an amount of time, uh, you may um, you know, have damage to your broadleaf uh, vegetables, uh, particularly tomatoes. They are very susceptible uh, to herbicide exposure uh, and even your mulch sources. So um, you know, I like to advise people not to use um, straw. Um, because you don't know what that uh, field was treated with and you may get some carryover even in there. Also, there's the risk and the issue of uh, introducing uh, seeds uh, with straw. So um, personally, I prefer um, pine straw, uh, less risk of introducing Johnson grass and some other noxious weeds uh, like would come with wheat straw. So um, Trying to think on some other common uh, types of issues. Um, sometimes if that compost um, is still too warm uh, or too hot, too active, it may be a little too rich in uh, nutrients. So you can have sometimes what looks like herbicide damage um, if you apply that compost either as a mulch or even if you incorporate it or till it into your soil. Um, you want to let make sure that compost is well aged, is no longer steaming in the morning um, because you can uh, burn up those tender roots uh, with nutrients. All right, well, if there's no more uh, questions coming in, I want to thank you guys for joining us. Um, Master Gardeners online, do you guys have anything else to, to add here? Yeah, somebody was questioning Ann. Packages that has the ant thingy stakes and stuck them in the corner of the garden. And I got rid of ants that way. I don't know if that was the best way to do it, but I didn't want to spread anything. Yeah, um, yeah there's not really any um, good fire ant treatment uh, labeled for vegetable gardens. So that's really important is to know that you know, any pesticide we use, is it labeled for uh, vegetable gardens, herbicides, insecticides, um, fungicides even. Um, and as far as I know, all of the uh, residential uh, homeowner types of products for fire ants uh, are not labeled for uh, vegetable mm -hmm. gardens. So um, mulch can help, you know, generally those fire ants do tend to like bare soil, uh, bare ground. So the more we can have mulch, uh, the less hospitable, hospitable of an environment we're going to create for them. Um, 
I, I've always found that fire ants seem to be um, uh, more common around my eggplants than anything for whatever reason uh, that may be. Um, and what I try to do is use some of the bait treatments uh, in the perimeter around my vegetable garden. And, you know, the, the foragers that go out uh, can, you know, maybe find it. And I just, you know, prevent some of those colonies from forming in the just general vicinity. Um, yeah, aside from that, dealing with fire ants in the vegetable garden is, is one of the harder things, I think, um, just from a, right. a safety and enjoyment Gosh. standpoint within the garden. Let me add this one, Josh. Uh, fire ants will forage up to 100 feet. Mm -hmm. So you can go 50 feet and put a bait out there. Mm -hmm. It's better to allow the ant to forage for the bait mm -hmm. and not contaminate your garden as well. Most of those baits are insect growth regulators. Mm -hmm. So let them forage for the bait. Do not put the bait on top of the mound. Oh, yeah. 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 Josh. Definitely. Yes, sir. Who's this? Ed Stumler. All right, Ed. Ants, what I know about ants, they're foraging in your garden looking for critters to eat, and mostly aphids. That's one of the predominant things that ants of all sorts will go after. Mm -hmm. I have a question about Kathleen said something about blossom and rot being a watering condition, and that you need to apply more water, she indicated. Mm -hmm. I, all my knowledge says something different. Yeah, so lack blossom, of calcium. Blossom, yeah, blossom end rot. I mean, one, it can be truly a calcium deficiency in your soil. So a soil test is important. Right. However, right. if we have periods where uh, we have too much water or insufficient water, then the calcium is just not being uptaken by the plant. Uh, yes. And so it shows in that blossom end rot condition. Uh, at that stage, uh, there's not a lot of correction. I mean, there's a, a product out there called Rot Stop where you spray the leaves with calcium. Uh, in my experience, um, you know, we tend to have it more in that first flush of fruits, that, that you know, that first ripening of fruits. If you're going to mm -hmm. have it, generally it's in there. You can just toss them, throw them out. And I've never had a year where I have, I have blossom end rot from, you know, first, first fruit set all the way through the rest. So just chuck the few that get it in the, in the early spring, early summer, and know that your plant's going to, you know, just sort of grow out of it. Because generally, you know, the, the soils are wetter in that, you know, May period as those plants are developing. So, um, but do know that you may have a calcium deficiency if you haven't done a soil test and just make sure that, you know, right. you've limed and, and added that, um, you know, calcium and magnesium. Mm -hmm. uh, if you use a dolomitic lime, you're going to get calcium and magnesium in with the increase in the pH. Right. And there was a question about eggshells, adding those to add calcium. Really, that's such a long-term uh, solution to a very immediate problem that sure, they will add calcium over time, um, but it's not an effective strategy to prevent or um, you know, control blossom end rot. Um, yeah, just doing a good job of uh, you know, regular watering, um, infrequent deep watering instead of, you know, just going out there every day when you get home from work with, you know, uh, a showering of water, um, make that more like once a week, twice a week, nice and deep, uh, applying most of that water all at once will, you know, just build healthier, uh, deeper rooted plants. And um, with our clay soils, if you're throwing out a little bit of water every day, you may run into a situation where our clay soils will start to crust and then, um, you know, create other issues then to where smaller amounts of water are not going to penetrate into the soil because you form this uh, nice terracotta crust over your soil surface. So, all right, well, gang, thank you for joining us. Um, if there's no more questions, more comments, um, I wish you nothing but fruitful success to your summer vegetable garden. Um, hopefully we'll be having tomato sandwiches uh, earlier this year if it stays warm like this. 
Uh, every day we get closer uh, to summertime, I think, well, we're, we're one day closer to being out of the, the woods for our uh, frost events. And I certainly hope so at this point because everything's more or less in bloom in the small fruits and the tree fruits right now. So if we have a frost, we might be in deep trouble at this point. So, um, all right. Thank you all. Uh, I'll shoot an email out uh, maybe by Monday with the link and uh, a quick survey. And I'll shoot you the links to these uh, UGA publications um, for more information. So thank you very much. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Thank you.